So now the details about how to actually set up for signing. Uh, you need to install a signing agent. This may require uh, an MTA upgrade if your MTA gets its DKIM service built into it rather than via a plugin. The mechanism I'm going to be talking about is a plugin. Uh, you need to tell it which mail to sign. Now, if you are running, let's say, a small organization and you have one box that is both your inbound and your outbound uh, mail gateway, and you say, just sign everything that looks like it came from my domain, then you're going to be signing mail from forgers as well. So you need to be cautious about not only which domain the message appears to be coming from, but what the source of it was. Was it an internal box? Was it an external box? Was it an authenticated roaming user? Was it just somebody? I don't even know who it was. So that's an additional input, not just which domains to sign, but what sources to sign. Then you need to tell it where those private keys you generated are. Uh, pick which signing options you want, and I'll show you some of them, but there are a large number of them. And uh, get rolling. Um, some, some things to consider when you're deciding how to sign your message. Body length limits, Dave talked about, they're a little bit controversial as well. And the reason for that is, the reason it was included uh, was uh, concern about mailing lists that might attach a footer to the end of the message. So if you have a 1K message that hits a mailing list and then it on the bottom says, if you want to unsubscribe, so forth, if you, uh, it, with plain DKIM, that would invalidate the message because now when you hash the body, compute the hash over the body, you're going to get a different hash out because the, the data set is different. Um, so one of the things that carried forward from one of DKIM's antecedents is this le body length limit feature to say, I only sign the first K or the first 2K or the first whatever of this message, or I signed this whole thing, but when it left me, it was this long. So on verification, you would play back only that much and compute the hash of only that much, and then the signature would still validate on the message even though there was additional data at the bottom of it. Now this has security implications. Let's say I send a piece of email to you that says nothing but the word hi, a spammer gets a hold of that, then he can send a message that looks like I said hi and then there's spam on the bottom of it. That will still validate because only the hi was, was protected. So be, be careful when you decide to use this. If you really want your mail to get through mailing lists and you start using this, uh, don't send anything short because there's, a, there's an attack vector there. Um, absent header fields, you can tell in a DKIM signature, you can say uh, I signed header XYZ, uh, even though that header wasn't even on the message. And what that, would ha what that would do is if someone down the line somewhere adds X, Y, Z, now the hash isn't going to work anymore. Because uh, the mechanics of that are a little complicated, but there are, this basically that is a way to say, don't allow this particular header field to be added anywhere down the line, otherwise invalidate the signature. Um, there are other ones that say, uh, actually what I just described was, yeah, those two points are almost the same thing. Um, uh, signature expirations, this is one of the ones Dave didn't bother to list because we haven't actually seen it deployed in the wild. Uh, it was insisted by some security people from uh, when DKIM was under development because all things that have keys and signatures have expiration dates, how could you leave it out? Well, we left it out, we didn't leave it out and nobody has actually used it. So, uh, that, But you can, if you find a practical use for this, say the signature was created now and I want it to invalidate itself in a week or a day or whatever period of time. That capability is there. What the receiving software will do with that is unspecified which is part of why it's not really very useful. Um, now, canonicalizations, which is a really big word, another way to think of that is normalizing. Um, if you are concerned, for example, that a message might arrive, when you send it, all your subject header fields contain two spaces, to, every word is separated by two spaces, and something out there might crush those all down to one, that would invalidate a signature because that changes the data, right? Uh, what relaxed does, if you set relaxed mode, will take, uh, will assume that all consecutive spaces are just one. Uh, what simple does, doesn't allow, it doesn't allow for those modifications. So if you are willing to tolerate some rewriting of spaces and refolding of headers and stuff like that, then uh, you can use relaxed. If you want to be intolerant of any such changes and make sure that your message arrives pristine exactly how you sent it, use simple. Decision to make when you're sending your messages. Uh, also note that the canonicalization stuff happens to the headers in the body separately. So you can say, I will allow these rewrites in the headers, I will not allow them in the, sub, in the, in the body of the message, or vice versa, you can mix and match. Uh, and there was an option to include forensic information uh, in your signature to say, here are the headers as I saw them when they left. If it fails when you got them, maybe you can diff the two and figure out what changed en route. So that's an option for, for when you're putting signatures up as well. Um, I have found, there's a, this is actually contentious because I have found this very useful. 
but uh, there are many people who think that it's an unused version, a piece of DKIM that just com complicates matters and we should remove it. So this is an example of one that is, for me at least, is on the fence. So a few things, now I'm gonna start talking about the, the filter I work on again. So you need to install the filter, it's a piece of software, just install it. Um, since it is a plugin, if you're using SendMail or Postfix or Sun JMS, they all have hooks for this thing called Milter. It's an invention from SendMail, which is a protocol by which the MTA will talk to its plugins. So if I refer to Milter, that's just the, it's the interaction between the MTA and its plugins. Um, that all happens over sockets, so you have to pick a socket where your filter will listen for connections from the MTA and to which the MTA will connect. So pick one and then tell them both where to meet. Um, that's why it's uh, referred to it as a rendezvous socket. Now there are some security considerations about this. If you have it listening on um, a TCP socket, an internet socket, your firewall people might have to poke holes for you. If, if you have it listening in a Unix domain socket, which is a socket that lives in the file system, um, file permissions come into play. So there are things to think about when you're picking out what socket to use and where, what type of socket and where do you want to put it. Put your private keys someplace where this filter can get at them, but nobody else can. Anybody who can get at these private keys on your machine can generate signatures on, on your behalf. So make sure, the, like, make a new user for the filter and make sure that the filter owns the private keys and nobody else can get at them. Your security folks will, I'm sure, will be happy to help you with this. And uh, make a list of uh, which keys will be used for which users and domains. <coughs> Write up a config file, which goes back through all the signing options I've gone through. Do you want the filter to auto restart or not? <coughs> And very importantly, which sources uh, should have their mail signed? And, and you have to figure out with your infrastructure and security people um, how to answer that question. So should mail from this subnet be signed? Should mail from these servers be signed? Should mail with this particular property uh, of the message be signed? Should mail uh, from SASL authenticated clients or TLS? You have a lot of things to think about but figure out which sources are sources you want to sign for and everything else will not get signed. Start the filter and tell the MTA to start connecting to it and watch, the, watch to make sure things start happening as they're supposed to. Uh, but that internal, uh, the, the, which clients is the, really the, one of the most complicated things you're gonna have to deal with, in a, especially in a large setup. So an example configuration file uh, looks a lot like this. The bold lines are the ones that are really critical. The other ones you can sort of, if you're interested, look them up. But, um, here I have a, a site called example.com that signs all of its mail with one key. It has a file called internal that um, contains a list of here are all the IP sources that I'm willing to, to sign for some, you know, CIDR expressions or IP addresses or subdomains, what have you. The selector that we're going to use is sign 201002 and the socket we're listening on is, is an internet socket, a TCP socket, port 8891 at localhost. So the, those five lines are the only critical ones. Uh, now, what this will do is it will sign mail for, um, it will sign all mail for, from sources uh, listed in the internal file if the from says example.com. So both of those things have to be true for the message to be signed. Then it will affix a signature using that private key, using this selector. That's basically what it's telling you. So that's a very simple setup, signing with single domain, one key. Now here's an example if you have lots of domains and lots of keys and, and uh, some, a management example of that. So we have, we're example.com again. We've gone back and we've made the domain partition. So I have four subdomains of interest, ops, marketing, exec, and just the top level. If you look in the second file here, I have a, and I have five keys that I'm using. The ops key, marketing key, the exec key, the president key, who's a specific person inside exec, and uh, the default key. So we've generated five keys, we have specific purposes for each of them, and we've listed how we want to use them. And at the bottom, the signing table simply maps people in the from field to which key that will be used for, to, to sign their mail. Fairly straightforward. So a message will come in, we'll look, at the, we'll look at the source, make sure the source is good, then we'll look at the from, we'll go to the bottom table and figure out which key to use, then we'll go up to the middle table and figure out where that key lives. Load it up and generate the signature. Um, the, the software that is able to handle flat files, sleepy cat databases, SQL and LDAP. So it should be able to roll out from into small sites and big ones. That's a, the LDAP support is coming out uh, in the beginning, beginning of March, but uh, we're, 
Um, we're trying to accommodate just about everything that people have, have thought of in terms of where you would want to store private keys. Uh, one thing to think about, and another thing that you'll hit with your security people, is if you want to store private keys in something like LDAP, they're probably going to squawk because that's a big public database and there are ways, there's a, it's compli there are complicated ways to secure that kind of information. So be very careful about storing private information in public databases. Now let's talk about the verifying side. Um, when you want to install a verifying agent, it's going to, the software is essentially the same as the signing agent. Uh, you need to tell it which mail to verify. So if you see a piece of mail from your domain that is coming from inside, you might think you need to sign it. So uh, there's logic around which ones you want to verify and which ones you want to sign. You might just verify everything anyway. Um, there are a lot fewer uh, verifying policy options than there are signing options. Signing is much more complicated to set up than verifying. And the reason for that is when you get a message that is signed, everything you need in order to con conduct the verification and make a decision about whether the signature was good is inside the signature. There's nothing for you to adjust really. You get all the information and you're going to be able to come up with a yes, no, or I can't tell right now type of answer, and that's pretty much it. The, uh, the policy stuff comes after the verification occurs. Uh, so yeah, we, just uh, something I mentioned earlier that an unsigned message and one with a bad signature are essentially the same thing as far as DKIM goes. Uh, any other verification, you cho verification choices you make uh, including whether or not to treat those two things separately, are outside of what DKIM recommends or specifies. So there's a lot of policy stuff you do on your side that we won't guide you about, we being the people who worked on the DKIM specs, because uh, it's simply outside of the range of what we plan to, plan to describe and formalize. But here are a few things you might consider on looking at in a message that verified. Um, you might require that certain headers be signed um, even if they were absent. Uh, so you are interested, I'm not quite sure what I meant by that. <laughs> um, you might require that a subject to be signed. So you get a message that, oh, I, I absent I meant not signed. Um, you get a message that uh, did not have the subject header included in the list of things that were signed. You might be suspicious of that because now you don't know if the subject header changed between the time it was signed and the time you got it. So uh, in your in Outlooks or, or Thunderbird or whatever, in this summary, the subject that's there will be shown to your user and could be misleading now. You don't know. It wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't protected. Um, and you remember that modifying or adding a signature that's, a header that's signed uh, would invalidate the signature. So you might, there are actually pieces of software out there that will require subject to be signed. Or you can have a list of, I, ha I expect these to be signed, otherwise I won't consider it a valid message. Um, the, the body length tag is an interesting one. We've talked about why. Um, you might decide, uh, I got a message that for which 1K was signed, and it's actually 2K long now. So you might compare the ratio of those two. It's twice as big as it was when it got signed. I'm going to consider that suspicious. Or you might say, no more than 80 characters or, or 240 characters, which might be uh, four lines of suffix that were added by a mailing list. So maybe I'll tolerate four lines, but not five. Or you, know, you could do it as a percentage, whatever math you want to apply. But so that's something you can consider when you when you're looking at a some message signed that way. Um, do you want to do something with these forensics? So I get a message that failed to validate, uh, and I observe that um, if the uh, we say that you, we say it in the specs that you can't actually make valid uh, acceptance decisions based on the forensics, but you might notice that. Uh, if, if the somewhere between signing and verifying the subject was changed in this way. So maybe I'll tell the signer, look, your mail got munged, I, need, I can see how it got munged, and that might be useful information to them to get their stream to be pristine again. And uh, authentication results gets into a, a slightly different area when, but I'll, I'll talk about it for just a moment. When a message is validated by DKIM, there's a standardized header to add to say this was what I validated and this is where it got validated. So if you picture the path it took, um, that header gets added at that point to say uh, this DKIM signature validated when it got here and here's the useful information from that that I managed to find. Like this was the D equals or this was the I equals. This is the domain that signed it and it passed when I saw it. But how do you know you should, if you should trust that, uh, trust that report about the valid validity of the message? So. You have to do some negotiation with your IT people about, uh, about a, whether or not to trust those headers. And if you go read the spec about that, it talks a lot about how to go about doing that. So that's what that last bullet's about. 
Um, do you want to apply ADSP? Like I said, there, there are um, risks to applying ADSP. So you might say, you might decide you're not going to, despite the fact that mail from mybank.com says discardable and this failed to validate, I'm not going to throw it away just yet because they might be having trouble. So um, whether or not you actually apply ADSP is completely up to the receivers to, uh, to make that decision. Um, signatures have timestamps, well, can have timestamps. And something I've noticed many times is that uh, I'll get a message whose timestamp is way in the future because somebody's got his or her clock set wrong. Um, you might just, there are some sites that say, look, if you can't bother to install NTP, then forget this. Um, if you, then I'm not going to trust your signatures. Or you could say, look, I'll tolerate five minutes of clock drift or what have you. So there's something, another policy thing that we've, we've uh, seen before. And again, third-party signatures, I've already talked about that. I won't spend another slide on it. So here's a possible configuration for verifying. Uh, the only thing that's really interesting here is the socket that the MTA will talk to the filter with because uh, the rest of it is pretty much automatic. They're all reasonable defaults. The last line there, the statistics line, um, if you enable statistics in this filter, it will begin recording. I saw mail from this domain. Here's the last time I saw it. Here's whether or not it passed. So you can see, let's say, uh, Google Groups was a good example for a long time, or no, Yahoo Groups, uh, they would sign their mail and then it would go through Yahoo Groups and the message would change. So nearly always we would see yahoogroups.com signatures failing to verify. The stat stuff can pick this up and say, there's probably a problem between us and them, we should figure out what it is. And then you might also be able to use this information to report useful statistics to us in the standards groups to, to figure out how DKIM is being used and possible limitations of it. So. The stat stuff is really kind of de under development, but still quite interesting. And now this gets a little more complicated. If you have uh, more complicated um, re policy requirements at your site, and my, my history is I used to work at SendMail, which you know, as you know is a kitchen sink of configurations, so you can make SendMail do anything in any weird environment. And I, my experience, and experience with this project shows that there are lots of sites that have strange little nuances that you can't always cover in a simple configuration file. Um, and we can't keep up with just adding new config files options to, delete, to deal with uh, every little weird site config that's, you know, every one-off. So uh, as of the next version of the software, you can write uh, scripts that, your, your admins can write scripts that will just take pieces of the, of the message and look at it and fold it in half and whatever stuff you want to do to decide I need to sign it with this key, or I need to verify it, or what have you. It's all the policy control is scripted now, and you have write scripts to whatever um, strange things you do at your site. We went with Lua, uh, which is a very easy language to to uh, add to uh, any C program. Uh, it's actually very popular in gaming, so you can write a Lua script that will take your avatar. I can't remember which game did this, but it'll take your avatar and it'll play it for you when you're not around. So that's the kind of flexibility that it has. Um, so OpenDKIM will uh, hand Lua, here's my message, here are a bunch of functions that you can use to find out bits about the message, go. And then when the script comes back, it has give, told it which signatures to add, whether or not to verify, what other, should I reject the message. And I just have a few examples here about how you can uh, write such a program. So here's a script that says, figure out if this client authenticated with, with SASL, um, if it didn't, and it wasn't, so the first line asks the MTA, was there a SASL authentication done? By asking it for the value of this auth author thing. And then if, it, if the source was not an internal IP address and the top thing didn't say yes, then I'm just gonna verify the message, which is this ODKIM verify function. Uh, at the, otherwise, at the bottom, then it did pass those two tests. It was internal or it was a um, SASL authenticated client, then sign it with its def key which is what that second function, that bottom function does, and that's pretty much it. Um, a slightly more complicated example, get the count of signatures on the message. If I saw anyone that was not from the author, so I didn't, I saw third-party signatures, then flag them to just be ignored. I don't want to pay attention to signatures that weren't from the author. And uh, this one looks to see if there have been more than 120 bytes added after signing. So you got a message that had that L equals bit on it, and there was, the message had grown by more than 120 bytes, then I'm gonna do this rejection. Too much data after DKIM protected body and issue a reject code. So you have, uh, with this software, you either have the older, simpler uh, config file stuff, or you can write scripts to do whatever kind of logic you want to apply to it. So uh, 
testing your setup, once you have uh, all your signing and verifying done the way you want to get it done, uh, or you think you want to get it done, there, if you go to dkim.org, which is a website I believe Dave maintains, there is a list of uh, autoresponders. You can send a sample message to one or all of them, and they will all attempt to validate your message by going to your name server and asking for the public key that matches your selector, et cetera, and send you back a report saying, here's how I tore your message apart, here are all the pieces that we found, here was the signature that we managed to extract from your, from your, uh, your test message. Here is uh, it's a few of them even go right down to here's every byte that I saw and the order in which I saw them, um, and then whether or not we were able to validate your message. That tests your signing, and then most of these, when they reply to you, will also sign their reply, which tests your verifying. When the reply comes back to you, it will attempt to verify the message they got. So you get to, it, this transaction gets, uh, tests everything in both directions. Of course, if you run two separate sites, you can just send mail back and forth between the two of them and see if they validate both ways. So a few topics, uh, I'm probably gonna be done a little earlier, I have time for Q&A, which is good. Um, RFC 5451 defines authentication results that I mentioned earlier. Um, there are security things that your, your internal people will need to pay attention to, like the indication of where this was added. Was it added by an MTA that we trust, or was it added by an attacker that is trying to convince me that this message was actually okay? So um, you should probably read the spec, especially if you're using software that applies this technology, because you need to be aware of which headers are, are safe and which ones aren't. And then we talked about uh, the, the word reputation gets bandied around a lot. So DKIM, like Dave said, associates a domain, a verifiable domain, with, uh, with a message. What does that really mean? So uh, if I send you a piece of mail from, uh, with an offer from Marriott where the O is now a zero, you're gonna know that that's no good. But how is a machine doing filtering over a billion messages a day gonna know that that's no good? We need to start associating value with names, and that's really what reputation, domain reputation is. Uh, in the DKIM world, we use the D equals part. Uh, it's, there's likely more value, and I think Dave touched on this too, there's likely more value in trying to identify and weed out the good guys and let them in faster than it is to identify the bad guys and let them out, because shedding a bad reputation is trivial. As soon as I've accumulated a bad reputation, then I just switch domains, or I switch users, or I switch, in, in the current world, I change IP addresses. It's very easy to dump a bad reputation. It's, it's going to be hard to get a good one and a challenge to keep it. So this will encourage people to make sure your borders are tight so that people can't hijack your reputation and start signing with DKIM so that once, we ha once these sorts of systems have been rolled out, uh, you will be able to uh, earn a good reputation and keep it with all the people that are watching. There are uh, both commercial and open source reputation mechanisms out there. A lot of them are kind of, here's the published list of domains that we know are good, that we've vetted, that have paid us to get on our good list. Um, there are some open source ones that attempt to publish um, a way for you to query uh, for their version of a reputation, and you should research. And the one thing that's important when you're picking reputation vendors is research how they get those names. Figure out whether it's a, is it a collaborative system that everybody's kind of voted on it across the whole internet, or is it a bunch of names that have paid to get on the list, or, or you know, figure out what it is you're, what sort of data you're associating with names and applying to your filters. Um, something that is, uh, it's sort of on the back burner right now, it came up for a little while and it, then it's gone quiet though, is, is reporting. Uh, a lot of sites would like to be advised of unusual activity, so if all of a sudden, someone's phishing as you, you're a bank, you're eBay, whoever, uh, someone's sending mail claiming to be you, you'd like to know about that. Um, so there, there are a few ways that this has been approached. One of them is to try to extend ARF, which was talked about in the previous session, I think Dave mentioned it a couple times, the abuse report format, which is a way of indicating uh, uh, that there was a complaint from a user back to the service provider. Um, so there's a draft proposal to extend DKIM, ADSP, and ARF to publish information, to, to be able to use this as a mechanism to report, we've detected you're being phished. You publish a DKIM equals all, but we're getting mail from, that claims to be from you that's not signed, and here's all the forensic information we managed to get about it. Um, this is really quite nascent stuff, uh, but it's, uh, it's on the, there's a working group that has it as their, later on in their charter, so it we'll, won't be too long before we start to hear more about this. Uh, if you're interested in developing software that's DKIM aware, the package that, I'm, uh, that contains the filter I'm talking about also contains a library that you can use to write your own DKIM aware applications. So you can go and check that out if, if, it's, if it would be useful to you, more useful to you than 
than implementing a filter. If you have your own mail MTA or mail transport stuff that is not uh, you, amenable to taking a filter, you can. Uh, there's a library here that'll help you out as well. Um, so this is a, a taken from a much older. Last June we did this presentation, so this is probably possibly outdated, but some. Uh, ISPs and other companies that are actually participating in DKIM quite readily, quite actively now. Um, Gmail is actually going to be here. I don't know if they're presenting at this one, but they were uh, they were big at the last conference too. Uh, and I believe uh, this was also taken from a previous one. I edited it, so this this is right. But I think there's only one other session that's really talking about DKIM, the signing practices one. I think is on Wednesday, so you can figure out what else uh, what else we're doing. Uh, and I have my own general references slide. There are, um, uh, the last one is the ARF working group, which has the DKIM reporting stuff later on in its charter. Um, but the rest of this is all, this will all be up for download from uh, the website. So if you have any questions, fire away. I mean, so just wanted to point out the, what's important about reporting and then come back to the point of it. Because it sounded like both of you had a particular idea about the value and purpose of DKIM, and, and f from our point of view as a as a brand, you know, we're looking at the value of it's protecting our customers from uh, phishing attacks, you mm -hmm. know, and where it's been pretty effective. Um, it's an interesting point. Uh, I I think that I don't think that I'm at odds with Dave's definition of what it's for or what it really what its point is. Um, but there are some side effects to the way it goes about it that you can that can be used as benefits, such as making sure the subject doesn't get tampered with uh, on a short message that might be used in a replay. But if you were to ask, what does this what does this give you? What one thing does this give you? It is most definitely the domain name. The the, the uh, I'm trying to be very careful about my language, but the the verified domain name. Would you say that's valid? Okay, I was about to say certified, which I can't use. But does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Probably. <laughs> well, what do you suggest? Yeah, that's a recent development, and I'm I'm hoping that the guy that I know that works there is going to be here because I'd love to talk to him about what they're doing and how they're doing it. But uh, as of the last mog was in Philadelphia in November, and I had just heard that news, but I haven't seen any kind of confirmation, or and I haven't talked to him yet. The reason, the reason I left it off is because I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite excited about that, but I want details before I start telling everybody, hey, guess what, Hotmail's doing it. Because I, I, want, I want to know how they're using it. Not only are you verifying it, but does it, does it, does it influence, do you have a reputation system behind it, you know, that kind of thing. Google does. Google does have a domain-based reputation system um, that is a, that into which DKIM is an input. Now, I, I don't know their secret sauce. They may or may not tell me, but it's, I know that it's being used that way. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Repeat the question. The question is, um, this gentleman signs uh, all of their mail with uh, their own domain, and if the customer requests with uh, a signature from the customer domain as well, is that right? So are there concerns about that with respect to uh, third, my concerns about, or my comments about third-party signatures? Um, I would say no, because in the second case where you have your uh, customer domain associated with it, that's what they'll focus on. I know, for example, that a AOL, uses the library that I was talking about, and they currently focus only on a first party signature, an author signature, so they would pay attention to that one. They would completely ignore a third party signature. So they would treat that mail, which only had the one, as unsigned. Um, that's their own local policy. They, they don't really know how to evaluate a third party signature or what it means or what it's telling them. So all, in fact, all of my remarks are kind of based around that general idea, is, is that there isn't any good guidance on how to handle third-party signatures yet. Right, right. So there's possibly some benefit there to, if you, if, if a, 
a, if a reputation provider is looking at all the signatures, then you, you stand to gain from Goodmail that contain good, pardon me, uh, Goodmail's a company name, so I have to say, uh, I have to say, um, valid accepted mail that comes from your domain benefits from also being, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's probably a good point. It's, but reputation is still so new that we, you know, that may or may not continue to be useful to you. Steve. Mm -hmm. So Steve's pointing out, for the camera, Steve's pointing out that um, uh, one use of multiple signatures has been one for the sender's domain, send, sending domain, and one for the domain that is uh, generating a feedback report. So that domain would also sign it, and it's a, use, it's a useful token for processing, automatic processing of ARF reports later on. So there's one possible application. Not, you're kind of dealing with two different mail streams there, though. One is, one is the uh, actual flow of mail. One is, one is sort of metadata about the flow of mail. But that's a useful application for, for DKIM there. Wore everybody out, I think. <laughs> well, if there's no other questions, we'll call that a wrap.